All right, so this was basically the landing page, but basically we, we talked through what I wanted to accomplish here, just who we are, who I am briefly. Um, and now I'll jump into the, the crux of it. So who am I? Um, I will say at the beginning, it was very difficult. I realized that I needed to take a whole lot more pictures than I take. Um, so I was going back to my phone, I was going back on Facebook and I was looking online for pictures of like, in one picture who I could say who I am. And unfortunately I wanted to have a picture of my family but I didn't have one available that captured everyone in there and I would be remiss if I left some important figures out. So I started uh, to think about, you know, who am I, not necessarily my family lineage, but who I am as a person and, and how is my identity structured. And when I thought about that, soccer came back to mind. So I grew up in Chesterfield and I grew up playing soccer. I started playing soccer at age five. And it's not very difficult, I think, for people to see who I am on this soccer team. Um, I was the only black kid on that team uh, through most of my career playing soccer, that was the case. Um, I think it's important uh, because, you know, growing up in the Richmond area, I was exposed to um, race and racial identity at a very early age, uh, a lot earlier perhaps than I think I wanted to. I had a very vivid memory of playing a soccer tournament in Stryker Park, which is now near oops which is now near short pump and on the way there we passed a sign for a kkk meeting and i remember asking my parents you know what is this about i remember being on the soccer field and people calling me derogatory names and those sorts of things um i chose to start with this story because throughout this presentation i'm going to talk about some like foundational themes that i think run present in my life and one of those things is um, just to work hard and be resilient. So my parents instilled in all of their children um, a good work ethic and the desire to continually improve who you are and a desire to um, not let your circumstances necessarily um, confine you in who you are. And so I wanted to start with that to say, uh, again, you know, I grew up in this area, I have an older brother and an older sister. Um, and yeah, so that's some background, early background about who I am. Uh, moving right along. So after I graduated from high school, to be completely honest, I had no desire at all to go to college. I didn't want to go to school. Um, I wanted to be a community organizer. I had an opportunity in college, I mean, in high school rather, to learn a lot of things. Um, particularly the Tuskegee um, experiments and, and what that meant for Black people and healthcare and medical education. I learned about um, just a lot of things that had me deeply troubled. And so I had, again, no desire to go to college. I thought I knew everything. I was gonna go on the streets and organize folks and make an impact politically that way. Uh, my mother and her great wisdom was not having that at all. <laughs> And she told me, you know, you're absolutely going to go to college. So I ended up applying and I went to VCU. Um, my first semester here at VCU, I was a physics major. Um, I was very skeptical of the educational environment. I wanted to, to learn things that I felt like couldn't be, um, couldn't be subject to, to bias. And so I figured going with something like physics and a hard science, it would be, you know, a good space for me to continue my education and then excel in a space where I, I wasn't worried too much about, you know, other people influencing me uh, unnecessarily. Um, in order to get a physics degree, however, you have to take these gen ed requirements. And so <laughs> I'm going through the gen ed requirements and um, I'm exploring different um, topics that interest me. And I had to take a, a philosophy course and I had to take an AFAM course. They were both intro courses and I was really just stunned after I took those courses. I realized that although I thought I wanted to be a physics major, I was really passionate about philosophy and African-American studies. And so it didn't take long before I changed my major. Um, first, it was just gonna be philosophy. And then I started taking more African-American studies uh, courses. And I really started to dive in it. Um, 
for you, Will, in particular, I remember talking to folks and they were saying, you know, what are you going to do with a philosophy degree and an African-American studies degree? I mean, unless you want to go back and get a PhD, it's like you really don't have these options. And so um, I wasn't concerned about that at all during the time. I still believe that you should pursue your passions. And when you pursue your passions, that, you know, the right opportunity will present itself for you. So I'm glad I made that decision. I think making that decision, I know rather making that decision has definitely put me um, on a path to where I am. Um, and it wouldn't have been possible without those things. Um, I also recall an early conversation I had um, with Dr. Rao when I first came to work in his office and we were talking about you know, my major and we were just saying how valuable it is, particularly to have a humanities background, um, the critical thinking skills, and the way you dive into analysis and understand different sources and materials are going to prepare you for everywhere you go. And so I'm very happy that I made that um, decision to study that. So then my uh, after I made those decisions, um, I was on campus and I was thoroughly enjoying myself. My first semester here at VCU, I had the luxury of not working. So I had a high GPA. Um, I remember doing school work out of boredom. I just, you know, I had so much time. It was like, wow. Um, but after that, I discovered that, you know, you got to pay for school. And so I just, I uh, talked to my parents and they provided me um, with a solid foundation that first semester. They wanted me to have a real college experience. So I stayed in the dorms and I, I had a good opportunity there. And then after that, I had to start paying for my own education. And so I heard someone earlier on the call say that they were, um, you know, they had been here four years, but they were not graduating until another year. And I'm here to say, you know, I worked full time and went to school full time, but not a terrible workload. So I, I took four or five classes. And so it took me a, a number of years to, to get out of school as well. So I definitely understand that. So. While I was working, um, I worked at the bookstore, I worked as an RA, and I also worked in the admissions office. And um, this obviously is a picture of the VCU Barnes & Noble bookstore. And I chose this um, in part because there was a salient lesson that I learned um, coming into the bookstore. So there were several people, student workers, who wanted to apply um, and work at the bookstore. It seemed like a good student worker job. Um, I like to read, my fiance will say I like to read articles and not books, but I, I do like to read. Um, anywho, so I'm working at the bookstore and there was this person working with me that would constantly complain about reorganizing the bookshelf. And I just could not understand it. I'm like, you literally signed up, you filled out an application to work at a bookstore. And yet every time you had to reorganize a bookshelf, you complain. And so um, I, I bring this up to say that it's very important that wherever you go is don't just do things because somebody else told you you need to do it or you know you think you might want to do it and you're not sure and you try it out and you don't like it if you try something and you don't like it there's nothing wrong with with walking away from that experience um, but if you stay in a role that you're not happy with you're missing opportunities to explore other pathways that might lead you towards your passion so i would encourage all of you you know to go out there and explore things but if you find something that you don't like and it's not bringing you joy, it's not adding to your life, you know, don't stay in those situations. Um, the other thing I learned um, being an RA was the importance of, of building relationships. And I'll talk about that in detail a little bit more. But, you know, one of the skill sets that they instilled in us as an RA is, is just the importance of communication and how communication can build relationships. Um, as an RA, there are several opportunities um, where you kind of find yourself in these difficult conversations with residents. Um, and I would say nine out of 10 times when we had these roommate conflicts or other conflicts involving students on campus living in, in the same environment, often for the first time outside of their family, you know, there's just a lot of, of potential communication breakdown. And one of the things that was remarkable to me is nine out of 10 times when residents came to me with uh, an issue, they had never spoken to their roommate about it. And it's something that I see in the workplace as well. Um, a lot of people come with issues, uh, whether it's through HR or 
just me as a supervisor and they complain about things or they feel slighted by certain things, but they've never actually addressed those concerns with the individual that they feel wronged them so terribly. And so I think it's also important um, just to get used to talking to other people, get comfortable talking to people and build those relationships. So when you do have to have a more difficult conversation, you kind of lay the groundwork and foundation for it. Um, I think that's critically important. I don't think I can overstress that enough, especially in the workplace. Um, just being willing to talk and make your grievances known um, is an important step. That doesn't mean that everything's always going to work out and it's going to be great, but just creating pathways to have those conversations really reduces a lot of issues. I, quite honestly, I don't want to get too political, but quite honestly, I think it would do you know our country a lot more good now if people just would be a lot more open to just hear folks and have meaningful, honest conversations. Um, the other thing uh, I learned during this time was, you know, working in the admissions office, um, it was a role that I wasn't fully aware of what I was getting myself into. So I came in the first day, and this is a bad story. I, I was debating if I was gonna say this or not, but I came in the first day and literally I had a black eye. So, <laughs> um, I was still, you know, hanging out with my friends and we used to play fight. And so me out there the weekend before my first day in the admissions office, I was play fighting with a friend and I got punched in the eye and literally had a black eye. And so um, it was really embarrassing. I was debating, you know, am I going to go to work the first day looking like this? You know, how do I want to show up? So either way, I went to work and I kind of explained a little bit of what happened, um, but I realized just how important it is to make an important first impression. Um, when I walked in there and people saw me with a black eye, they had all types of assumptions and judgments. And so I really worked hard um, to kind of allay some of those concerns that they had. And I did my best to kind of show them that, you know, this is a one-off occurrence and, and don't judge me based on its appearance. But in the admissions office, there was another reason why I wanted to bring this up was um, it taught me just the importance of being very detail oriented in your, in your work environments. So when I went to the admissions office, I was working with someone now who's a VP. Um, her name is Sybil Haller and for, for y'all who are familiar with VCU administrators, but she gave me this list of a thousand applications to go through. And in the midst of these applications, they were in stacks of a hundred and she wanted me to verify the count. And so on the very last one, there was only 99 applications in that stack. And so I was kind of frustrated with her. Like, why are you giving me this task? It felt, um, it didn't feel like it was a genuine task. And over time I talked to her and she just wanted to see if I could be trusted with details, if I was gonna cut corners and those sorts of things. And I bring that up because it's, it's been important in my career trajectory. Um, just to not take those shortcuts and to really work hard and be detail oriented. And even when things might not seem as if, you know, they're, they have a direct benefit for you. A lot of times, you know, you, you can't really um, imagine how those things are going to unfold. And so, yeah, that's part of that work experience. Um, speaking of not imagining how things unfold, um, so again, as an AFAM major, I ended up taking some history courses and I took Dr. Moit's uh, History of the Caribbean course. And I would just say that if you take a professor and they have an assigned reading and they wrote the book, you really need to re read the book. So <laughs> the first day we're in there, um, not the first day, um, the first exam we had or the first paper we had, um, I did very poorly on it. Um, I thought I was a smart student and I was like, I got this. I've been doing well in my other classes. I'm not, you know, I can read it. I can kind of skim over it and I'll, I'll do fine. That was not the case at all. Dr. Moy like destroyed that essay. Um, he told me to come by and see him during office hour. I did not like Dr. Moy at all. <laughs> I would sit in the back and Dr. Moy would call on me when I didn't raise my hand. And I'm looking at all these other people in the classroom and I'm like, you got people raising their hand, like, why don't you call on them? But, you know, Dr. Moit was very adamant that he was going to engage me and not just me, anybody. And for those who have taken him um, 
in a class, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I feel like he always knew when I wasn't prepared and that's the one time he wanted to call on me. So, um, but anyways, I went to his office hours and I realized that, um, I realized that Dr. Moore really cared about his students and cared about my success in a way that a lot of other, uh, quite honestly, a lot of other professors don't. And so initially, like I said, I didn't like him. I didn't appreciate what he was doing, but he really taught me the importance of showing up and again, doing the work. Um, he didn't write me off. He gave me another opportunity. He told me, you know, you, you have to do the work, you have to do these readings, but if you do, you know, you can be successful. And so, <laughs> Um, after that, I went back and I read the book and I studied a little bit differently and I ended up, you know, being successful in, in writing a good paper. In fact, it was always like a, a catch 22. I'm shy. Even now speaking, I'm kind of nervous. Um, and so for, again, those of you who have taken a Dr. Moy class, you know that when you do well enough, he asked you to read your essay out loud. And so... <laughs> I hated that. Again, I felt like it was, you know, my goal was to be like the second best in the class. Like I wanted to get a good grade, but I didn't necessarily want to have to stand up and read my essay. Um, but I can't overstate enough just how important it was, you know, talking to Dr. Moyt and realizing that, um, you know, he has very high standards and that those standards are what's going to be necessary to set you apart later on in your career. So I'll tell another story related to that. Um, I don't know how many of you all are familiar with how professors get tenure, but part of their tenure process is, you know, a student evaluation and they get letters from students and that goes into their portfolio um, to, to be a tenure professor. And so at the same time I, I was interacting with Dr. Morton this way, I was interacting with another professor and it was just like a, another message that really resonated with me. And the other professor told me something that made my interactions with Dr. Moore make more sense. And so she told me that, you know, most professors will be nice enough to you just so that you can write a nice review. They're not gonna necessarily be mean. Um, again, they want these positive course evaluations. The coursework might not be that hard. Again, you have sites like Rate My Professor where they want these nice evaluations. But in the end, um, they're not challenging you to live up to your full potential. And so uh, when I heard her say that and kind of thought about who Dr. Moyt was and how he was communicating in his class, it just made me realize that, you know, the further you go along professionally, there's always gonna be smart people. Um, there's always gonna be people that work hard. The thing that's gonna set you, or that are organized, the thing that's gonna set you apart is, you know, are you willing to do the work? Are you willing to be, um, you know, when people aren't looking, are you, are you, you know, doing the readings? Are you, in my case, you know, are you doing the background analysis to understand, um, you know, the trends in higher education? Are you surrounding yourself with smart people to help you engage in these meaningful conversations? Those are going to be the things that um, set you apart. Like I said, everybody's going to be smart in the office I work in and with a lot of the meetings that I'm in, you know, everybody has a PhD, but what separates people is, you know, their work ethic and just how committed they are and dedicated and quite honestly, you know, how passionate they are about their experiences. And so I definitely can't say enough how much I appreciate it. Um, again, Dr. Moore just really set in a higher bar that, that I was able to, to jump over. Um, so again, for those of you all who have taken Dr. Moy, and even if you haven't, if you're familiar with the Alexandrian Society in any way, I know you've heard about Barbados. And so Dr. Moy um, used to talk about the program in class, and I decided that you know I was gonna I was gonna go on this trip. And uh, in Barbados, I uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do it. I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to afford it, but this was actually the first student loan I took out was to go on this summer study abroad trip. And again, I said it initially, but I did not like Dr. Moy at all initially. And then we went to Barbados and the very first day, I mean, it was just like, to me, it was almost like a completely different person. I remember thinking like, wow, uh, this is somebody who, um, likes to work hard and play hard. And that's something else that I think I kind of took away with it as well. I'm kind of using my personal life where 
you know, it's important to work hard, but it's also important to reward yourself and to enjoy your downtime. And so I would definitely encourage you all to do that. Um, I was mindful in presenting this information today. Um, I wanted to talk briefly about Barbados, but I, uh, I, could, I could talk about this literally for hours. It was a life changing experience. So I'm gonna touch on some of the things that I personally appreciated about studying abroad. Um, but if you all have any questions and you wanna jump in or want more information or anything like that, definitely feel free to do so. Um, but the thing um, that was so impactful for me, um, you know, I had never traveled abroad. Um, I had an opportunity through this program, you know, to, to go to a majority black country. Um, and for me personally, that was a, a life changing moment for me. It really changed my paradigm. It was the first time that I felt um, I didn't feel like I was an outsider in a space. Um, it was just a very unique experience being in a country where, you know, first judgments, whether real or perceived, weren't related to my race. They were, you know, how is whatever it is we're talking about, you know, um, it was a lot more focus on, you know, meaningful conversations. I remember in one example, I was talking to someone um, who was a bus driver and they knew more about American politics and policies than anybody else I had encountered here in the US. And it, it just amazed me at just how educated and informed people were and how um, just rich and meaningful it seemed their lives were. And so that was a great experience, uh, meeting people, uh, Bayesians and Barbados. The other thing that it was really helpful, and I'm sure other people have talked about this before, but you know, part of what I believe is, is really helpful in building a career, especially if you don't have a true pathway mapped out, is building the right relationships. And again, being around people who challenge you to be the best version of yourself, who engage in, in these good conversations. So Cy, um, who did the presentation last week, um, he didn't, I, I didn't meet him in Barbados, but I met Dennis, who in turn inter, ended up introducing me to Cy. And I remember one time, you know, we were all hanging out and we were just talking about life in ways that really just opened up my mind and, and wanted me to, to try harder and be a better person. And um, I think it's important, again, when you surround yourself with successful people, with passionate people, they do nothing but bring out the best in you. So um, that's what I'll say about Barbados. It was, it was a phenomenal experience. Um, I did have, like I said, trouble finding photos. I had no problem finding photos of Barbados. I just struggled about which ones to pick. So I, I still have a lot of pictures from that. It was a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, but that's kind of like what led me to my first actual, you know, job. So as, as was said in the introduction, um, after Barbados, I ended up graduating. And shortly after I graduated, I got my first full-time role. So as I alluded to, I had these three jobs and I was in the admissions office and I had worked and interacted with the president's office on a number of events. Some of those events are things like uh, welcome week and open house. The admissions office still to this day, you know, interacts with the president's office. And so I did that and the president's office was impressed with, you know, some of the projects that I presented for them. And so they asked if I would be willing to, to come over and work there. Um, obviously I was excited. So I'm like, yeah, absolutely. I've been working in the president's office. So I, I did that for a while. And then again, upon graduation, I, um, I got my first job as a, a full-time employee here at VCU. Um, I think what's important, and again, it goes back to following your passions. The job that I had in the president's office when I first started, it was a job that didn't exist. Um, that's something that I'll say quite often through the remainder of this presentation. These are opportunities um, that prior to my arrival just weren't there. So I had the luxury, I guess I can say luxury, it's, it's kind of difficult at times, but I had the luxury of writing my own job description for my first job. Um, which was exciting. I got to kind of cherry pick the areas that I was interested in. I got to pursue some of my passions. Um, and so I, I put together this, this portfolio of things that I wanted to do, which primarily was to give me more exposure to um, various aspects of the university. And then uh, 
just touch on all of those things. And then at the same time, just, you know, continue to build my professional development. Um, I'm not sure if you all know what this is a picture of, but this is actually a picture of our governor's office, um, the governor of Virginia. It's a very small office. Um, it, obviously you can see there's not a lot of, um, you know, it doesn't have this humongous desk. It's not this grand ornate space, but um, it's a space that I, I never thought personally that I would be in. Um, and I chose this picture because um, sometimes when, when we're going through our lives, we, we're not sure where we're gonna end up and how we're gonna get there. And so with this particular experience, um, after I had an opportunity to create my first position, um, I wanted to make sure that other people who came after me would have a similar opportunity to be exposed to these experiences at VCU. So we created something, me and my former supervisor, we created this program called the Presidential Student Ambassadors Program. It's PSA for short, it's, it's still alive, it's still going on. Um, we just recently went through a recruitment cycle. We're gonna have another recruitment cycle um, coming up in the next semester. Um, and basically the goal of this program was to, um, the goal of this program was to basically, to the best of my ability, kind of replicate my experience. And so again, I came and I had this opportunity to create a position, but what this does is we bring people in from all over the institution, uh, different majors, and we kind of expose them to just various opportunities that VCs offer. So we meet with uh, the provost, we meet with um, the CFO, uh, we meet with uh, the Dean of Medicine, we, we meet with a whole bunch of administrators, we meet with folks in athletics, we meet with folks in the Rice Center, and we give this an opportunity um, to learn more about VCU and to have our students have an opportunity to talk um, and pick these administrators brains. Um, there's a little bit of a pre work associated with it. So you have to do some readings and we have these facilitated conversations. Um, but this is an important program to me because I think it, it gives people an opportunity, like I've said earlier, and will continue to say, to explore their passions. Um, the one thing I can say about you know, my career trajectory so far, it has been very much uh, passion driven. It's been very much just taking the opportunities that present themselves and showing up in meaningful ways. Um, and so, yeah. So after we created this program, um, I was thinking about, you know, what am I going to do next? Again, I have this career in African American studies um, and philosophy. I'm not quite sure what I want to do. Um, I still have this strong desire to give back. And so um, at that point, I started um, really focusing in on community engagement work. And I'm not sure if you all are familiar with the East Marshall Street Well Project, but it's a project here at VCU where during construction of the Contos building on the MCV campus, we found uh, quite a few human remains. Um, these were predominantly African-American human remains. Um, and we went through a very difficult reconciliation process. So these remains were unearthed in the 1990s. And when they were first discovered, it was a different VCU administration. And there was this desire to kind of um, hurry this process along as fast as possible. So there were literally, I want to say about, I think there were 44 remains, like full skeletal remains, and there were quite a few partial remains. Um, when we discovered these remains, um, the administration at the time gave the archaeologists one weekend to go through a pile that they had basically dug up with a backhoe of human remains and kind of pull out what they could. Um, they were basically just discarded in a pile and um, the construction of the building continued. And so when I was working in the president's office, you know, I was very aware of kind of some of the climate um, changes that were going on in the nation and going on in the Richmond area. And so for those of you all who are familiar with um, some of the professors here at VCU, Dr. Yutzi did a documentary on this issue about these human remains. Um, at the same time, there was an African burial ground controversy going on. That was something that I was involved in as a student as well, um, where I was kind of protesting that. But 
I brought this up to say um, it was a passion project, but in addition to being a passion project, it was really uh, an opportunity to kind of leverage some of the skills that I had learned all the time um, throughout my tenure here at VCU in my early career. Um, we had to go and work in these environments where people were highly, highly distrustful of VCU and higher education experiences. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with the book Medical Apartheid, but um, the community that we were serving definitely was, and they had a high degree, of, again, a high degree of mistrust. So we're going into communities that are very hostile situations. I've had people um, in organizing for this East Marshall Well Street project. We had people, you know, yelling at us, cussing at us, telling us we weren't wanted, not believing that our intentions were pure, um, not really understanding that, you know, that was in a different administration and we really wanted to work to reconcile and kind of heal some of these deep divides in our communities. Um, but I, throughout this process, um, you know, when you show up and you work hard and you're responsible, um, people start to notice. And so, you know, it started off <laughs> people giving us angry looks and, and personal attacks on me and who I represented coming from the president's office in these communities ended up being, you know, lifelong friends. Um, I still keep in touch with some of these individuals today. They all have my cell phone. I have theirs. Um, if it weren't for this COVID experience, you know, we would definitely be uh, continuing to meet up in person. Uh, but again, it's just important when you show up in these spaces that you always, always, always do your best. And um, yeah, so that was that community engagement experience. Um, again, as was said in the introduction, community engagement is something that continues to be important to me. It's something that I, um, I want to continue to do in every aspect of my career. Um, it's an opportunity to, for me personally, just to feel more connected with who I am as an individual and, and make sure that I'm giving people an opportunity um, to be successful when they follow in my footsteps. Um, I will end on this slide. So this is a picture of the president's office. Um, it's located at 910 West Franklin Street. This very front uh, window to the right is my colleague's window, the window that you can't really see that's behind the pillars to the left. That's where I currently am in this office. So um, yeah, this is where I am. And what do I currently do? So as was said in the introduction, I am the budget director or the administrative director here. Um, our budget in the president's office and permanent funding is about $25 million. When you include one-time funding, it can get up depending on the cycles. You know, we can have as much as, um, I would say $29, $30 million annually. Um, might sound like a lot of money, but again, it's being distributed across quite a number of various units. Um, I'm kind of hesitant. Uh, I'll give a brief overview of what I do. I don't want to get too into the details and, and bore y'all to death, but again, if you have more specific questions about what I do and my role, you know, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. But the long and short of it, basically, um, I manage the budget for, as was said, um, government relations, inclusive excellence, equity and access, university council, audit and compliance services in the president's office. And so what my role is, is to take all of these competing folks who many of them are cabinet members here at VCU, and many of them have great ideas and great initiatives that they want to put forward. And my job is basically to tell them, no, we can't do this because we don't have the money for it. Um, that's the, the short end of it. In practice, what I really do is, you know, I really do, I have to say no quite often, but what I try to do is find ways to, you know, best utilize the limited resources that we have um, and find as creative solutions as possible to make sure that we have the funding um, to move some of these initiatives forward. One of the best, uh, one of my examples that I think um, I'm most proud of, there was an inclusive excellence initiative a number of years ago that went through the university budget process and it was, it was uh, declined. So the university said we didn't have any money for it. It was about a $300,000 initiative 
And I was able to leverage my relationships with some of these other cabinet members. And basically they allowed me an opportunity to borrow money from their units. Um, so basically I went around and built this coalition, um, talked to folks about, you know, why I personally thought this was an initiative that we needed to push forward and and having those one individual conversation with folks, they were each willing to, to give a little bit of their budget. And so we were actually able to fund that request. Um, and I look at that as seed funding for a lot of, you know, initiatives that I feel really good about that are currently going on here at VCU. So I did want to leave a little bit of time to talk um, just to have a conversation and answer any more specific questions. Again, I can go into a lot more detail about what I currently do, but it's kind of esoteric and I don't want to bore you. So with that said, I'll open it up to any questions. If there were areas that I was unclear on, which I'm absolutely sure there was, if you want to ask more um, questions about that, I'm, I'm happy to talk about that. So whatever y'all want to talk about, any additional follow-up, let me know. I guess mine would be more so like advice. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any tips for getting through um, grad school while still working full time? Mm -hmm. So uh, time management is critically important. Um, that quite honestly, for me, it was, it was a difficult experience. It was something that I thought, I thought it was going to be, um, I'm not going to say I thought it would be easier than what it was, but I kind of underestimated how much work it would be. Um, the number one thing I could say was, you know, definitely be focused, um, have a great support system and people around you. For me, you know, I like to hang out with my friends. I like to take trips. I like to travel. Um, I had to put a lot of that aside. You know, I had to really focus in um, and do that graduate school work. The other thing that I think for me, again, was very beneficial and I would encourage everyone to do is really know who you are as an individual and your study habits and when you're successful. So I wake up really, really early. Most days I wake up around 4 or 4.30. And the only way I think I could be successful was to... Um, I did a lot of my schoolwork very early in the morning before I came into the office. I would work very hard and focus in the office. Um, and then I would do a little bit of schoolwork again. And then again, you know, wake up the next morning and do it all over again. Um, for more practical tips, I would say if you're not using a to-do list or you've invested in a system that really works for you, I would encourage you to do that. Um, part of what we offer are interns who work in our office, we require all of them to read the seven habits of highly effective people. I'm not saying that that needs to be your system, but I do think that that book helps um, demonstrate the importance of having a system. And I think it gives a good uh, backdrop for, you know, the types of things that you want to pull out and utilize in your own personal life. So I would definitely recommend that book. If you haven't read it, it's relatively easy read, but it's, it's helpful. Um, the other thing I would say about um, graduate school, and again, I'll go back to this, is about pursuing what you're passionate about. So for me, that decision kind of rested on, you know, I had this career opportunity in the president's office to ascend to the role that I'm currently in. Um, but quite honestly, among some of my colleagues and peers, there was this notion that, you know, Stephen knows what he's doing. He knows the work but he doesn't have this, this background in any accounting degrees. He doesn't have a business degree and we're trusting him with, you know, upwards of $30 million a year. And they kind of wanted to make sure that it was in good hands. And so for me, I looked at, you know, where I wanted to go, um, how I could utilize, you know, my role in this office to help fund some initiatives and projects. And it was important to me. So, you know, that was my focus for going back to graduate school or for going to graduate school rather. Um, I would also say, again, you know, you, you really need to, to pick something you're interested in because there are going to be plenty of times where you don't want to do that work at all. Um, another thing I will say, since you mentioned graduate school, um, part of what we had to do was give a presentation. And my particular group, we had to present to William and Mary, uh, the College of William and Mary, we had to present to their board of visitors and their president. 
and just yesterday they called me and they're going to move forward with some of my recommendations and they asked if I would be willing to be a consultant with them moving forward. So again, it's very important, I think, to show up and do your best. You never know where it's going to take you. The one thing I've learned about my career, I haven't, and, and I hate to say it out loud, but I haven't had this real detailed roadmap. My, my roadmap has literally been to take advantage of the opportunities that I have at the moment and do the best that I can and keep my head on a swivel for the next opportunity. So I hope that helps answer your question. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Perfect. Any other questions? And again, it, it can be about anything. I'm happy to dive into this stuff in more detail. I tried to tell a story that was meaningful to me, and I recognize it might not necessarily resonate with you in the same way. So, Well, it, you know, it's kind of crazy how much it resonated with me because you mentioned you know, when you first took your first philosophy class and you first took your first AFAM class. And it was, it was the same for me. Like I just took philosophy 101 and I took AFAM 101. And I mean, that was just it, you know, I just knew. And I I really liked how much like sort of your personal interest was a centrality, you know, like sort of the guiding force behind you. And I just, you know, I feel that a lot. It's great to see how successful you ended up being. It makes me feel good. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely opportunities out there. Again, I, I keep saying it because it really is that important to me. You know, we're in a competition. You know, we're competing internationally with students. We're competing nationally, locally. And, you know, you're competing with your colleagues. That doesn't mean that you necessarily have to be, you know, combative. But I think there's wisdom in what Dr. Moore would do and, you know, having these students read their their essay, you know. It, number one, it, it, it's a clear indicator. Like if you're competitive, this is a person you need to, to look towards. Um, the other thing is if you, you know, if you weren't selected to read your article or, or essay rather for that particular assignment, it gives you an opportunity to say, you know, what was a top mark? What did a top grade look like and sound like? And how can you adjust accordingly? And I think that lesson is, has been present in my personal life. You know, when I, see someone give a very nice report or a good presentation. I try to take a, take some lessons learned from that and incorporate it into my own life. Um, I actively seek out people who um, are where I wanna be. You know, I have several mentors. I actively seek out mentors. Um, I seek out mentors for very specific purposes. I don't think you have to have one person that can be your roadmap and your guide, you know, for everything. If you see someone that you might not personally like too much, but they're really successful in in a certain space, I would definitely encourage you to build that relationship. You never know what you can glean from them. So I've had quite a few mentors, you know, in addition to Dr. Moy, uh, Dr. Moy has been one, you know, that I'm very thankful to have met. Um, and I've had quite a few, you know, we still keep in contact. It's, it's important. Happy to answer any other questions. Talk about anything. If there's not necessarily questions about my role, but, you know, VCU questions that I might be able to answer, I'm happy to talk about that. Dr. Moy and I joke every time we talk that, you know, I'm going to give him some money. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, um, thirty million to me is a lot of money, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah. It has to go a lot of different places. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of different places, a lot of commitments, you know. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I know I've asked you this before, but you know how we have struggled in the Alexandrian society to to keep afloat and to invite some really good people on campus, especially now. And, you know, all along VCU talks about diversity, diversity, and that's what I've been doing for, for all this time. Mm-hmm. But it's been difficult. And years ago, I met with um, Kevin Allison. Mm-hmm. And he, um, you, know, you know, bounced around some ideas, but we were never able to get any help. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, I don't, know that anything has changed of course the sga Mm -hmm. is still around but that's been really um, off and on and difficult to to kind of deal with so um administrations come and go the um provost there's a search for the provost as you know right now 
Yep. And there are all kinds of changes, but the, the, the Dean for Humanities and Sciences is new, but seems to be focusing. One of, one of the things she seems to be interested in is the promotion of the diversity. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, you know, that's, that's what we do, but we don't seem to be able to get any help. Mm -hmm. So what I'll say to that is we can definitely help as, as we talked about before, you know, for us in our office, um, because it's the president's office and because we have a global perspective on, on the university and these initiatives, you know, I can commit to you that we're definitely willing to support it. We just need to go through um, funding requests that basically go up the chain. So is this an initiative? And I think for the Alexandrian Society, it shouldn't be too difficult. This is an initiative that I know uh, the history department supports. I know um, the college supports. I know the provost supports. And basically, when we um, have an opportunity to get a commitment from those three levels that, you know, yes, this is something we support in an ideal situation when they put money behind it, you know, I'm definitely happy to fill whatever gaps remain at the end. Particularly, um, we kind of joked about this, but on a more serious note, if there is, you know, a notable, strong, notable speaker um, that will raise the, the profile of the institution, I'm definitely happy to engage in those conversations about how we can, you know, find some money to, to help bring those folks to campus as well. So. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's great. But on a general level, I mean, we bring folks in all the time, but I know what you mean by notable. You, you, uh, I remember when Cornell West came here, how big that, event yeah. that was, but you don't catch those big fish all the time. Right. We catch a lot of great people, but that's not necessarily uh, the, the big fish. But I'm talk on a general level, if you ever have any ideas, not now, I mean, it doesn't have to be now, but mm -hmm. maybe how, if we present um, a plan or whatever, you know, is there a way that we can, and it will always involve the intellectual activities, bringing good, right. good folks in, but um, we've run into a lot of roadblocks with the SGA and it's, um, it's, it can be really, really difficult. So I don't know if on a general level that if we've got some ideas, we can bounce them to you and say to you, for example, uh, do you, is there any way in the institution that we could, we could get some help? I've talked to Inclusive Excellence, for example, and mm -hmm. that, that the leadership there has changed from time to time. And there, was, right. there were times when um, I would get help from them. Mm -hmm. When Dr. Mitchell was here, right. uh, I didn't think I would, but I approached her and she, she helped me out. And then um, Dr. Hobsburn, Hobsburn as well right. would help me out. But the last time I, I, I approached, um, you know, uh, I made that approach it was, you know, why don't you start with the history department? If they don't help you, you got, why don't you ask them to help the dean? And if mm -hmm. nothing at all works, then come back to me. But look, um, you have to understand the kind of, pro I think you know the kind of professor I, I am. My pitch is full, you know, always. Mm -hmm. Even just a few days ago, you know, one of the scholars wrote to ask me to do something. It's, I've, never, I've never been able to, to sit back. It's just one thing after another. And, the Alexandrian society consumes a, a good deal of my time. So having to run around to all admin, the, the whole administration just to get a little bit of help to me is not um, the best way that I can, uh, as I see it, to use my time. No, I, I definitely understand that. And we can follow up about some of these things. I do have, I understand why they tell you that. And it's a message that, you know, I appreciate them saying, and I, I definitely understand from your perspective uh, why that isn't necessarily the best use of time. But I think we can find a, a good middle ground that I, I feel like we could both be good with or happy with. Okay, so maybe what we can do, uh, things are, as you see with COVID, we have turned to this medium, mm -hmm. but there will come a time I would suspect when things will come back to, you know, a little by little to normal and maybe what we can do is meet, some of us maybe meet with you, the leadership can meet with you and just, just again, maybe um, 
bounce off some ideas and a path forward because I'm a right. person of, of action, not just, as you know, mm -hmm. not just ideas, but I, I always want to see action. Something should happen. How can we make things real? Right. You understand? How can we um, show that, you know, how can we show, for example, that Black Lives Matter? I've been talking about that. Because mm -hmm. if you look at the history department site now, we've, we've worked up some statements right. about uh, a diversity statement. That was an interesting exercise, the, the back and forth between us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people wanting to make changes to this, changes to this sentence. And after a while, I said, look, enough is enough. I'm not going back to the drawing board. So um, the, the, the chair of the history department agreed with me and some others. And we put it to a vote. Right. We put it to a vote. So the vote, uh, I won't discuss the, the breakdown of the vote right now, but, right. but um, we squeak by. And mm -hmm. it's now a part of what we do. All I'm saying is, you know, there's a lot of talk about diversity, about you know, Black Lives Matter, whatever, but I, I'm, I, I'm for action just to, at VCU to let's demonstrate that these things do matter. Right. And if they do matter, why, why aren't we getting a little bit of help to do what we do since we fall right in, in, into those categories? Mm -hmm. No, I, I definitely, like I said, I definitely understand. And I think we.